Okay, wonderful. So uh, thank you very much, Casey. Let's uh, proceed. Okay, so before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of it, let's start with a case study and try to get into the mindset of what students in this situation might be feeling or, or how they may perceive the, the situation. So let's imagine that you're an undergraduate student at a small rural college and you're attending a physiotherapy program. So you and 10 classmates are attending remotely and you're teleconferencing with a large university in a nearby city. So the instructor in the city is teaching to the students in that classroom um, that are, are present physically and then they're teaching remotely to your location, which is in a, a small uh, rural college. So let's consider these three questions and we'll see these three questions come up a few more times um, throughout the session today. Um, so first thing is, how do you feel about learning in this context? In what way is your experience different as a local versus a remote student? And what can the instructor do to maximize your learning experience? So let's go to the next slide, please. And let's focus on just this first question here right now. And we'll do a little activity uh, where if you can answer that question in one word in the chat and um, hold on before you hit enter to submit the response. So let's try to all get our, our um, uh, entries into, into the chat. And then in a, a few seconds, we'll say, please hit enter. And then we'll, we'll see all those kind of water falling down together. So how would you feel as a, a student in a small rural college being taught remotely from a, um, a large university in a city uh, in one word? Okay, so let's, let's hit enter in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Oh, wonderful, excellent. Interesting. Yeah, so we're seeing some uh, some some consistency here. Uh, we're seeing intimidated, fortunate, isolated, excited, challenged, uh, disconnected, and disadvantaged is coming up quite a bit. We have alone as well. So uh, very interesting collection of sentiments. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see though that they're not all negative. I, I like to see that fortunate and excited are two of them um, because as we'll talk about today, there's lots of benefits as well to this sort of. Uh, approach to teaching. It's not just we're, we're putting a video camera in and trying to get this to some more students to fill the seats type of thing. This is actually related to a real case study uh, that occurred in Australia a few, year, a few years ago, I think from uh, 2016 to, through 2018, uh, where they were trying to build uh, capacity in, in the medical industry in small towns and found that they had more success doing so by uh, uh, adding physiotherapy programs to small rural colleges rather than bringing people from their small communities into larger cities where they tended to stay. So this was one way that they could extend knowledge and opportunity to smaller communities so that they could build that medical capacity in these small towns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps people can't move to a, a city or can't leave their, their location, perhaps family ties or, or other reasons. So this is kind of bringing, um, bringing it out to them and giving them access to it as well. Okay, so the learning objectives for today's talk. So as you may have guessed from the title, uh, we'll start with the out, by outlining challenges and benefits of teaching in a multi-campus learning environment. And then we'll frame a discussion on student experience in multi-campus courses using the Community of Inquiry framework or the COI framework. And then we'll identify pedagogical best practices to maximize student experience. And then finally, through these case studies, we'll reflect on examples of multi-campus instruction from around the world. So over to you, Christoph. Thank you. Right. So let's begin by, by oh, I shouldn't say begin, but let's move on by, by asking the question, what is multi-campus instruction? So uh, it's, it's a term which uh, you, you might have seen in different forms, cross-campus instruction or inter-campus instruction. It goes by a few different names, uh, but I want to put it in context. So I'll give a couple of examples of what it's not and then talk a little bit about what it is. So uh, here we have a situation which I think a lot of people here are familiar with. We have our classical lecturing scenario where we have professors and students co-located in a single location uh, in a lecture hall of some sort. Learning primarily happens in the classroom and through take-home learning activities and assignments. So I think this is one that we're all very familiar with at this point in time. 
Next up, we have remote learning, which is something that uh, I think has been, regrettably in some cases, a lot of people have become familiar with recently. And so in this scenario, we have a professor at home uh, and students are all separated from one another. It could be in more or less the same location or in completely different places around the world. Uh, I know I've certainly been teaching students from all over the world in this last semester. Uh, ICT or information communication technologies are used to communicate, uh, such as Zoom, as an example we're using right now. And it will include both synchronous and, as and asynchronous components. This is what we'd call, let's say, as remote learning. We then have a high flex system, uh, which is a blending learning or hybrid model. So in this scenario, students can choose uh, either remote instruction or in-class instruction or purely asynchronous learning as they please. So there's an emphasis on student choice, which is the flexibility in high flex. Uh, hybrid, meaning in-class, remote, asynchronous, uh, as they please, forming the high flex model. It's it's um, a few years old. There's actually a lot of interest in interest in high flex currently as a as a blending learning model, um, and and potentially some some benefits to be realized through high flex as well. And then finally, we we'll talk about multi campus learning. And so what we're what we're referring to specifically, and what we're talking about today, is where we have multiple groups or cohorts of students at separate campuses. So we'll have a scenario where we have let's say a single presenter teaching to a classroom at one campus, which we call let's say the local presenter, and then we have. Uh, ICT teleconferencing technology to other campuses it can be one or more. So dual campus is quite common. An example would be uh, UBCV and UBCO. Let's say where we have a professor teaching a class at UBCV, and then we have students at UBCO attending in a, in a lecture hall intended for teleconferencing and participating in classes synchronously that way. So campuses may be in the same area or in a completely other part of the world. Now, uh, for this one, we're going to ask you to use the annotations in Zoom. So you'll find those under options at the top. Uh, note that uh, feedback at this time is marked as anonymous. So by, by all means, th throw in your ideas. Uh, and, and the question I'd like you to ponder here is what could go wrong? So we're introducing the, the uh, challenges that we might encounter uh, with, with multi-campus instruction. Uh, many of you have already expressed one of your sentiments uh, in, in terms of how you would feel as a student, let's say, in, in remote situation, but as an instructor in this scenario, uh, what do you think could go wrong? And we already have some ideas coming up here. So, so one individual has mentioned technical difficulties, which is a huge, absolutely huge issue. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we progress through our presentation. So we'll give about a minute or so for others to, to offer their feedback. Uh, if you're having difficulty finding the text tool under annotations, again, click on options at the top. You'll be able to go down to annotations. And then uh, in that bar, you'll find the text tool as one of the options. You should be able to click somewhere inside the gray area and then put in some feedback. So just in a few words, um, speculate a little bit on what could go wrong from an instructional perspective or a learning perspective in facilitating a multi-campus course. And then, uh, Casey and I will move some things around. So hopefully everything remains visible. All right, so we have people mentioning things such as equity, poor sight lines, ah, another excellent one. I'm gonna loop, loop that over here with technical difficulties. Lack of engagement with and access to instructor, yes. Uh, that, that, that groups very nicely with equity. Hard to build a community of learning, also very, very true. And we'll give, let's say, another 30 seconds to this. Challenge of practical learning in medicine, physio, and nursing. Yes, uh, as, as mentioned, Casey and I are part of the Manning program. So we are both engineers, uh, which means that our courses tend to be very lab heavy. And a lot of the labs that we conduct necessarily are hands-on. So how then do the remote students access those labs? Uh, and certainly in the case study we mentioned earlier in physiotherapy, how do you then engage in lab work and hands-on work? Uh, remotely as well. So another very uh, important challenge to consider the planning phase. Okay, let's say another 10 seconds if you have any additional thoughts. Perfect. Uh, students have different prior knowledge in the two locations. Yes. Um, a great one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so context is very important, not just uh, context in the course overall, but context at individual locations uh, can be very challenging in the planning as well. And then accommodating students with disability. Yes, accessibility is another very important factor in this. There are, um, uh, let's say, scenarios where you might have microphones positioned where someone has to walk up to a microphone where they, they can't do so if, if they have certain types of disabilities. Okay, that's wonderful feedback. So thanks, thanks everyone for that. I'm just going to save this here, uh, clear it, and we'll move on. I appreciate those insights. Okay, so from there, uh, with challenges in mind, we'll talk a little bit about some of the benefits that we encounter with, uh, with multi-campus instruction. So at an institutional level, uh, you'll find that uh, 
for obvious reasons, there are reduced program costs by sharing resources. So if you're teaching one course extending between two campuses and, and this process is reasonably efficient at an institutional level, you don't have to hire as many instructor, instructors or at least as many instructors with that particular expertise. Uh, and, and you can have much larger classrooms because you have many more students. There's shared administrative resources as well between both campuses to, uh, where they can both help facilitate the program and the course. Additional shared lab resources available to students as well. So you might be able to have, let's say, uh, one lab at one location, another lab at another location, uh, fewer specialist instructors required. Uh, there's also collaboration between campuses, building relationships. So uh, there, there's, uh, for instance, an opportunity to, to increase collaboration, increase communication between multiple campuses. Again, uh, just improving rapport and improving uh, community of learning. Uh, there's larger class sizes for niche, niche courses, which, which means that in some cases courses can actually occur. So if there's a very fascinating topic that, uh, that let's say only has three or four students at one campus, if you can share that topic amongst multiple campuses, then suddenly you can make that a real course. Uh, Cross-campus student projects, new dynamics for student teams. So for those uh, coming from engineering, we have a lot of student teams that work on some fascinating projects. Uh, expanding the pool of students and access to those projects is, uh, is a definite benefit for the institution. And then transparency and information sharing. So greater consistency in curriculum, content and assessment and cross-pollination of ideas. Uh, having, let's say if you are uh, teaching a certain course and that course, uh, and you're responsible for three or four different campuses, if every campus has their own instructor and approaches the course in, in their own way, then you'll have a little bit less consistency perhaps uh, in, in how that program comes together. Uh, and certainly in engin engineering, it's very relevant to us because we have to go through an accreditation process. So by having one, one instructor that essentially oversees and engages and, and teaches all these courses, uh, or, or the one course across multiple campuses, we'll see greater consistency in curriculum content and assessment. Now for educators, uh, so the teaching in, in a multi-campus context ideally is a little bit more engaging than a fully remote model. So at least you're in a position where you have some students, you're, you're looking at students, you're in front of students, you're standing, you're talking, you can draw on a board. Uh, some of us really enjoy the, the fully remote model, but uh, We'll have to see what the sentiment is once we're back in the classroom. Uh, but certainly being on site with a number of students can aid social presence, can aid uh, the, the uh, teaching presence as well. Uh, there, it's simpler and less time required than the high flex model. So the high flex model is very, very beautiful and a wonderful learning experience, but can mean a lot of work for the instructors as well, because you're preparing a, con a course that can essentially be taught through a variety of different means. So there's a lot of additional work that needs to go into making that course available, accessible and, and effective through, through multiple means of, of dissemination. We then have additional and greater variety of students and interest. So having the opportunity to work with, uh, let's say, campuses that are in completely different countries or that, that exist in a very different context than the one that you're accustomed to is, a, is an awesome individual learning op opportunity for educators. Uh, there's also additional instructional resources potentially available as well, where you work with TAs in different locations. And uh, it opens up additional resources at other institutions. So other institutions may have uh, different types of labs, different types of equipment than you're accustomed to. And it allows you to collaborate with those other uh, campuses and, and offer those technologies to your students as well through, through remote means. There may be, there, depending on the proximity of the campuses, there might even be field trips involved. Uh, some of the best benefits I think are realized by the students. So uh, first and foremost, there's a greater variety of courses available. Uh, you have access potentially to tech electives at multiple campuses, access to experts at other locations. So if a, if a campus, let's say, has a certain course that absolutely fascinates you, if it's offered in a multi-campus context, then you might have the opportunity to take that course where otherwise it was not available to you. Uh, campuses can focus on, on availing their experts at other locations as well. And so if there is that artificial intelligence expert at one campus, uh, a different campus than your own, who is offering a course in this format, you have the opportunity to take it, which is one of the bigger benefits. Uh, there's easier transfer between institutions. If, uh, if there's greater collaboration and greater cohesion, let's say, in the course is offered, then it's, it's easier to have those transfer credits and transfer between programs uh, at different campuses. Uh, greater consistency in standards, as I mentioned earlier, and then opportunities to collaborate with non-local students and cultural exchange. So that can add a little bit more interest and a little bit more intrigue, let's say, uh, in, into the classroom experience and um, uh, hopefully add a little, uh, a little some, something uh, different to the learning experience. So with, the, <laughs> with those benefits mentioned, uh, let's, let's dig back into some of the challenges that we can encounter in this. And I'll pass this back over to Casey. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. So um, let's start again with uh, a bit of a case study. So imagine that you're a graduate student in Rwanda, so like an MBA student, um, synchronously attending a course that's taught from India or in India. You and 30 colleagues attend the course remotely, and you're one of 
um, or there's five other campuses in your country that are also attending. So you're one of six campuses in Africa that are attending. Um, you, there's a centralized instructor teaching remotely in India. Uh, they're teaching a class, a class of 130 students, um, as well as teaching remotely to these six other campuses. local versus a remote student and what can the instructor do to maximize your learning experience so let's focus on the second question again and do kind of what we did before but this time let's go six words or fewer and we'll um, hold off so please enter them in the chat and then we'll hold off until um, everyone's had a chance to prepare them and um, and then we'll hit enter at the same time so let's let's give uh, give everyone a, a little bit longer here <clears throat> and I should mention this is a real case study as well. Uh, so there, there are uh, certain topics that are taught in India that, uh, because of, of uh, the, the criticality of expertise, are, are not available in rather easily available in Rwanda. And so this would be, would be an example of a, of a multi-campus course that's taught actually across nations and uh, across larger bodies of water. So in very, very different contexts, but enabling people in Rwanda to learn topics that, that would be otherwise very uh, difficult to uh, find in, in their own country. Yeah, so I think Dean's kicking it off. So let's, let's all hit enter, please, and um, give our responses. So Dean's got a great, great insight into that. Cultural context is different between the two countries. Absolutely. <clears throat> so very, um, very much different um, culture, different language. Um, yeah. So we have some further insights. Uh, we have here community engagement with my prof and cohort classmates. Yes. How do you build community in, in scenarios where you have such different, uh, culture and different locations, perhaps even different time zones, mm -hmm. uh, different teaching approaches as well, uh, as mentioned here by, by Chris. So there, there's also a sentiment here that uh, you might feel more connected with your, with your local cohort than, uh, than your colleagues in another country. And this is something that's also very often observed is, is this notion of, of um, almost fiefdoms that appear based on your, based on your uh, individual campus. So, so building community across uh, locations can be very, very challenging and, and much more so even than in remote instruction because uh, you do have a, co a collection or a group of students that, that can see each other and, and they're much closer to one another at their individual campus than they are to those students on the other side of the screen needs to be managed very, very delicately. And it's certainly one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in formulating these courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That, and that kind of ties in with uh, different teaching approaches, but pr different procedures or ways to engage in class activities, um, perhaps different ways even of addressing the instructor. Um, when I was an undergrad student, I, I transferred from one school to another. And I remember at one school, Everyone, all the instructors went by first name. When I went to the other school, everyone was doctor or professor or, or what have you. <clears throat> Great. Well, what do you think, Christoph? Shall we continue on with the slides? Sure. Yes. We have one final comment here. Uh, possible different procedures or ways to engage in class activities. Yes. Uh, and that is definitely an organizational challenge. So if you have TAs, let's say, uh, hosting courses locally, and those courses certainly have, have hands-on uh, components or um, uh, let's say there's a lab component or a demo involved, then uh, the, the experience with the TA may be quite different and managed quite differently, uh, certainly with the local resources than, let's say, what you'd have at your, at your uh, facility in India. Um, th this can, can cause a, a significant feeling of inequity, which is a, which is a concern that uh, some of you had mentioned earlier at the, at the start of the presentation. And another comment about language and pronunciation. That's a, a great comment as well. Um, even though they're both speaking English, I'm assuming, there might be different accents or different words, different dialect that they're using that may make communication more difficult um, as well. Okay, well, thanks very much uh, for your insights on this one. Um, yeah, great ideas and, and great, uh, great insights into the challenges that you might face uh, teaching this sort of environment. Great, so we'll present the challenges try to present them in the context of the community of inquiry framework, the COI framework. <clears throat> um, and um, 
part of the, the main challenge is maintaining presence. And we see presence in a few different forms. So social presence, uh, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. And we'll get into that in more detail shortly, but just a, a quick summary. So social presence is kind of that community feel. And we've already talked about that um, a little bit in, in some of the comments that we've made, um, feeling that sense of community, either feeling more of a sense of community because there's more students in your country or because you're in a rural area. Um, but that's, that's a very important aspect of teaching and learning um, is that social uh, presence or that community feel. Then the next one is cognitive presence. So kind of paying attention, being alert, being engaged with the instructor. Um, these days with, um, with spending so much time at the computer and, um, and uh, perhaps seeing other distractions that are readily available for students, it may be difficult to remain engaged and fully alert the, through the whole um, teaching experience. And then finally, the teaching presence. So that's kind of based on trust and clarity. Um, and that really kind of ties everything together. And that's what, luckily, that's what the instructor can have the most um, influence on. So let's go into more details on the next slide here. Um, so starting with social presence. And um, we have a, a quote from the original um, author that developed the COI framework, Garrison. And his quote was, we define social presence as the ability of participants in a community of inquiry to project themselves socially and emotionally as real people, i.e. their full personality, through the medium of communication being used. So <clears throat> there's this sense of kind of being a real person, being, uh, being yourself, uh, the same kind of feel as if you're sitting in a classroom and, and there's someone right next to you and you can express yourself, that your personality um, um, to them you would want to do the same thing through the communication system being used. Um, there's other challenges related to the intra and inter cohort social presence. So um, there's obviously two very separate and distinct groups and challenges related to managing them and um, trying to get them to mingle if, if possible, um, as well as the technical challenge of, of bridging the students in the um, the remote students when they're doing activities. So how are you um, able to kind of uh, get the students to perform the activities that you're requesting and how can you, you monitor their progress? Um, something else that can be a big challenge are adversarial relationships forming between the local and the remote groups. So <clears throat> this comes up quite a bit in, um, in case studies if, uh, if it's not managed properly. Um, I guess people become frustrated and then they kind of um, revert back to their their cohort or their local group of students and and see the others as um, as part of the problem. But um, this can be healthy if it's managed properly and equitably. So it can be healthy in the sense that there's kind of a healthy competition and that's pushing all students to do better. Um, on the flip side, it can be dangerous if left unmanaged and can can lead to strong feelings, um, strong negative feelings. Let's say. Um, so next up is cognitive presence. So challenges related to maintaining a cognitive presence. And um, well, I have a quick definition of, uh, of um, cognitive presence from, again, the author of the, the COI framework. So with the cognitive presence, we, we start with a trigger, triggering event, if we look on the figure on the top right here. And that's kind of often um, introduced by the instructor. Um, and that's kind of identifying and engaging in a problem or a question that we're trying to, to think about or learn about or, or perhaps solve. And then we move on to exploration where we think to ourselves and we kind of question it and brainstorm it and um, try to develop that a bit further. And then we move over to integration where we integrate that into our um, existing model of how things work or existing mindset um, and kind of reflect on how that fits in with other things we've learned. And then finally, we resolve it or move to resolution where we apply that new knowledge. And, um, and that's the kind of the, the end goal of the critical thinking. So what, what often happens or what can be a challenge is getting the students to complete all the way through that cycle. Um, oftentimes, students may just get to exploration or integration and may not finally close the loop with um, res resolution. And this actually shows up to be um, different for local and remote cohorts. So uh, local students often um, can, can get to the resolution phase 
uh, where when remote students have have trouble doing that sometimes. Um, and that's um, that's quite important because that's kind of when when the ideas come together in, in one's head. Um, <clears throat> The other part of cognitive presence too is keeping the learner engaged when they're staring at a screen. So keeping them alert, keeping them um, entertained to some extent. Um, and then often with remote cohorts, they can start to get distracted and maybe talk with themselves, become disinterested. And that happens a little bit differently or maybe, maybe in a different context than if they're sitting in front of the instructor who's um, in person 10 or 20 feet away from them. They, they feel differently if they're going to start talking to their neighbor, then if the person, the instructor is remote, maybe there's, they feel um, more inclined to talk to someone and not, not feel that sense of being rude. Um, and then we see poor retention and focus because of that. And then finally, we have teaching presence. So challenges related to teaching presence. And then again, this is where the instructor has some, to an extent, has the control over the situation. But um, the, another quote from Garrison is the binding element in creating a community of inquiry for educational purposes is that of teaching presence. So this is kind of the glue that's holding everything together. And this is the, where the teacher can have um, the most influence, let's say. Um, so one challenge can be related to the quality of instructor interactions. And that relates to student satisfaction, perceived learning and the overall sense of community. So talking with your instructor um, is, is something that can be uh, can, can have a great effect on how you perceive the class and how you receive that information. Um, and of course, a poor teaching presence can lead to disrespect, disengagement, uh, and dissatisfaction from the students. Um, as well, educator, the educator has influence inside and outside of the classroom. So um, this relates to equity and um, trying to keep the both cohorts of students on the same same level. Um, <clears throat> feeling that um, a student in the local class can go up to the, the instructor and talk to them after class is, is a big challenge or a big um, difference between the students that are remote and local. And that can have an effect on equity. The students that are remote feel that they don't have access to the instructor and can't just go up and ask a question before or after class. Whether that, uh, whether students actually are doing that or using that, um, advantage or not is one thing, but the students that are remote may think that they cannot do that. And it's kind of a perceived inequity. Um, as well, the instructor has a, a, a bit of control over whether they, they relay the fact that the remote students are included and if they matter as much. Um, and then challenges as well related around authority. Do the do the local students respect the authority of the instructor? Do the remote students respect the authority of the instructor? And how does that um, come in together with the whole learning experience? So next slide, please. And I'll hand it over to you, Christoph. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Casey. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, so we've, we've discussed some of the benefits, some of the challenges. Let's talk a little bit about some of the best practices that we've found. So um, a lot of the case studies in literature uh, come to their own conclusions, of course, within their individual contexts. Uh, but only recently do we really start seeing formalism appear uh, where, where there's some effort in the community to build a, a good collection of, of pedagogical best practices for, for implementing multi-campus courses. And uh, there's still a lot of discussion as to, to how high up the chain this needs to go uh, and, and what level of support is required, not just at the course level, but at the program or even university level to make sure this happens well. So you can imagine that based on the number of challenges that we discussed, uh, the situation has to be handled rather delicately. So there's a lot of steps to achieving, let's say, a very successful implementation of, uh, of a multi-campus course. Uh, one, one common pitfall, and, and this is something a lot of people encounter when they first dabble or move into developing multi-campus courses, is, is mentioned by Sheldt Spolt and, and Bamani here in, in their paper in 2019, where just adding video streaming technology to distribute a single campus lecture to other campuses is not sufficient for providing good conditions for learning. And this is, uh, this is often demonstrated through case studies that uh, where, where, where educators have, have attempted to, to put together new courses, uh, in some cases being very strict in terms of the formalism and others just trying to adapt existing courses and, uh, and often um, making very interesting observations as they go. 
So recently, as I mentioned, there's been some thought to formalizing uh, an approach to, to developing these courses. And uh, there's a framework actually proposed by uh, Bamani and Schelsfold, and I apologize for the pronunciation of, of those names, but uh, they, they refer to it as their proposed framework for multi-campus course development, rather aptly named. And you can see it here on the right. And so they begin, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just at a very high level, give you a sense for some of the steps involved. Uh, there's a pre-contemplation phase, uh, and, and this is typically at a departmental faculty or even higher stage. Where, where campuses are beginning to have the conversation uh, and laying the ground rules for how a multi-campus course may take place. And so this is even before we've really looked at the course itself, uh, is this something that is supported and desired by the institution? Is there uh, a lot of institutional weight behind uh, this, this objective? Uh, contemplations where we, where we actually start thinking about how the course should look and, and what, what it is we want to include in that course and how we want to structure it. Um, we then move into the planning phase. So learning activity design. And you'll notice that here we actually have learning activity design as the number one step, the first thing that we should do in planning. And, uh, and, and this is something that was stressed by uh, Bamani in their work in 2019, that uh, learning, object learning decisions should come before delivery decisions. So it's really very important to, to think about how, um, uh, what, what it is you need to teach in this contemplation stage uh, and uh, move right into how can you engage your students as much as possible. So uh, focus very much on activity uh, even before you spend a lot of time uh, or, yeah, on, on dealing with um, uh, more detailed subjects of planning. Uh, there's also a stress down here, integrate, don't duplicate. So multi-campus teaching is generally not about using uh, identical strategies at all campuses, rather it's about using an inclusive suite of flexible teaching learning strategies for all students. And so this again is reflected kind of at this contemplation learning activity design level, where you're really thinking about how to uh, integrate individual contexts into the planning stage so that the course is built from the ground up with, with a multi-campus format in mind. And uh, context here is so incredibly essential uh, because as we discussed, context can vary so much from institutions to institution. It's one of the greatest challenges to manage. And only then do we really start thinking about preparation. Uh, and, and assembling our course. Finally, during delivery, uh, something else I'm gonna point out that's quite important is observation. So in much the same way that context is essential in the planning stage, observation is essential in the, in the delivery stage. Uh, Multi-campus courses tend to be rather temperamental. They're, they are tempests in a bottle, meaning that if things start going wrong, they can cascade out of control very, very quickly. So uh, even more so than normal courses, it's rather important to get constant feedback or regular feedback from your students uh, to, to ensure that they are experiencing uh, a sense of, of community through social presence. They're experiencing a sense of teaching presence as well. They feel connected to the instructor and, and they have that uh, a cognitive presence. They feel engaged through the instruction. The learning activity design is working well for them. So uh, using something such as a community of inquiry uh, as part of the, the delivery process of the course is quite helpful in understanding how the students are, or how, how effective the student experience is uh, in the course, especially in the early days. And then maintenance is also rather important as well. So um, understanding what worked and what did not work and even going all the way back to contemplation and, and reflecting really on whether or not this course is appropriate for a multi-campus format uh, if, if necessary. Uh, another factor in terms of best practices, technology. So certain uh, technology is a huge part of this problem, uh, much as it is in remote instruction, and high flex instruction as well. So there, there are four uh, large categories here that seem to come up. And the first is visibility. And I know some of you mentioned this as part of the activities earlier in this lecture. So all students should be able to see whiteboards, demos, instructors, and ideally each other. Uh, it's, it's so uh, easy for a student to get lost if they can't see what's going on. And so if they're sitting 20 rows back in, in a conference hall, staring at a small screen with a projector up ahead with all the lights on, uh, where everything is washed out, and, uh, and they have this, this vague image of, uh, of, a, of a whiteboard where an instructor is using, a, let's say, a red marker to, to make notes on a screen, and they're desperately trying to read this and, and, and take notes, uh, it's a very ineffective learning environment. Uh, so, so putting a great deal of emphasis on visibility in terms of your classroom design, uh, the preconception phase even. Uh, is, is very, very important toward, toward having a successful multi-campus experience. Uh, equity is a topic that comes up over and over again. Many of you have mentioned it. It's super important. Uh, it's, it's one of the most critical factors in, in successful delivering a multi-campus course is ensuring that there is a feeling of equity amongst all the students, amongst all the cohorts. So uh, you want to avoid engaging in learning activities while excluding other cohorts or that operate at very, very different levels uh, with other cohorts, cohorts as well. 
So um, one, one thing that tends to happen quite commonly, uh, which, which is just natural for those of us who are, who are comfortable teaching in a regular classroom setting, is students approaching the instructor before or after class uh, with additional questions. And you always have students that are a little bit unsure, a little uncomfortable, and so they'll come up and, and they want to ask questions about the content. And that's all well and good. Uh, but in this situation, um, if the remote cohorts who are no longer connected because the, the class is over, the, the connection is terminated, if they learn that there's additional support being offered after class to students at one campus and not at others, that can lead to great feelings of inequity. Uh, another one that's rather important as well that comes up is announcing assessments to all students concurrently. So if you are giving assessments support or advice or talking about assessments in synchronous sessions before the video starts at the beginning of class, uh, or before the, the ICT connection engages, then that can also lead to feelings of inequity. And so often it's recommended for any announcements at all in a course uh, that, that's multi-campus, that those announcements be, be delivered asynchronously uh, through some medium such as Canvas to ensure that all students receive them at the same time. Reliability, huge, huge issue. So uh, as soon as technology fails, students at remote campuses will just collapse. Everything drops, teaching presence disappears, um, uh, that social presence, that connection they have with other students, the other cohorts, that disappears. Uh, and, and of course, cognitive presence, I mean, the course ends and then inequity builds up very quickly. So reliability is so incredibly essential. Uh, priority access to IT personnel is strongly recommended for courses. And again, this requires that institutional engagement. Educator training on equipment, also very necessary. If things break, how quickly can you fix it? If things go wrong, the camera points in a different direction, how quickly can you adapt? And then backups in the event of failure are also quite important. So these are all conversations that should happen at the pre-contemplation con and contemplation fa uh, phase when, when uh, beginning the process of developing a multi-campus course. And then finally, accessibility, uh, another very critical one. So minimizing barriers to participation, such as single microphones. If, um, if your students in your remote cohort have to stand up and wait in line uh, to access a microphone to ask a question, whereas students in your local cohort just have to raise their hand, then that, that also not only gives a feeling of inequity, but that is an accessibility issue within your classroom as well. So it's quite important that students are just as free no matter where they are to ask questions, to engage in conversation, uh, and, and to feel involved in, in the course. So in the course design phase, um, throughout the course design process. So once you're past that pre-contemplation phase, you're developing your learning activities, you're designing your course, always keep in mind the cognitive presence, teaching presence, and social presence uh, and, and in terms of how you structure your pedagogy and, and apply your pedagogy in your teaching. So at, at the course design, design phase, consider things such as active learning as much as possible. Um, teaching presence, look for trained educators, not just facilitators at all your locations. Uh, to maintain that teaching presence, it's at, at minimum necessary to have a TA at every campus to help us facilitate discussion to help uh, ensure that every community is, is, is thriving at every location. Uh, but, but beyond just having a TA, those, those TAs need to be trained effectively in, in uh, the tools they need to manage those classrooms remotely and, and maintain these three levels of presence. And then social presence, so sensitivity to cultural differences. Um, make sure that you're very aware of context, not just at your own classroom, but other classrooms as well. Uh, there's even a lot of people that are proposing that a flipped classroom is the best way to go for a multi-campus course, where rather than act, the, the instructor acting as the sage on the stage, uh, they're more of the guide on the side and, and prompting and facilitating discussions in individual campuses and inter-campus as well. So, so building that community uh, through, through primarily student-led discovery and learning. And then of course, asynchronous course elements uh, help a great deal because they're a fair bit more equitable. Um, than, than uh, let's say something you share synchronously. So equity is also very important, not equality. And I just wanna highlight that difference right here. So sensitivity to an individual learning context, again, very critical, not every classroom is the same. And the course needs to be designed with a flexibility to respect specific resource, cultural and accessibility constraints at each campus. Uh, do all students have roughly equal access to training spaces, lab spaces, and libraries resources is a big question in this as well. If you're dealing with, if you're teaching at a very large campus and you have lots of small campuses that are connected, um, do those other students at those other campuses have access to um, study spaces, to lab spaces, to, to libraries and other instructional resources that the students in the large campus have access to? And if not, what can you do to help balance that, to, to, to in increase that feeling of equity? And then lastly, I'm just gonna mention here maintenance. So multi-campus courses are delicate and can be very adversarial. It's, like, I said, like I said, it's so easy for things to go wrong. So um, monitoring that, that sense of presence, monitoring the student experience is very important inside the course. And then reflecting is very, very important as well throughout the course and afterwards. 
so regularly assessed pedagogy and student experience, frequent COI surveying. There, there's a wonderful uh, a vetted COI survey available um, distributed through the University of Athabasca. It's a, it's a fairly easy survey to implement. Uh, students can answer questions and give you some wonderful insights into how they perceive teaching presence, social presence, and cognitive presence in the classroom. Uh, daily journaling and self-reflection for the instructor is recommended by a lot of people who've undergone these case studies. So uh, after you teach a course, uh, take I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, and just make some notes. How did it go? How did you feel uh, as an instructor in that environment? And how, uh, what worked and what didn't work? And that'll help guide better decisions moving on and, and hopefully highlight issues uh, early while they're, while they're still easy to address. Uh, and then respond quickly and decisively to student concerns, naturally. So implement changes as permitted within the scope of your syllabus, show some flexibility, uh, show that you're willing to respond to student feedback, and then plan for extensive content and pedagogy revisions between terms, especially early on. And as you're learning uh, and developing as, as a multi-campus instructor, uh, you may have to go back to the contemplation, uh, contemplation phase for significant revisions. So uh, final case study, we'll bring this one a little bit closer home. So imagine that you are a student at UBCO. You're attending an engineering course taught by UBC or taught uh, at UBCV. Uh, you and your 30 colleagues attend the course remotely. The labs are offered remotely for your cohort, locally otherwise. So you have students, let's say that uh, at UBCV, they have the local lab space there. And then as remote students, you connect to that lab environment remotely and conduct the lab remotely as versus the local students who can do hands-on work. So again, we'll, we'll ask those same questions. And these are questions that you should be asking as well as part of best practices in developing these courses. How do you feel about learning in this context as a student? In what ways is your experience different as a local versus remote student? And what can the instructor do to maximize your learning experience? And uh, we'll, we'll leave you having just talked about best practices to, to think about and reflect on this question, on, on what you would do in this situation to improve equity, to improve to, to maximize a student experience through presence in the classroom. So uh, bringing this to a close, uh, we have a summary. So uh, there are certain significant benefits to multi-campus instruction, to the institution, to educators, and to students. Uh, availability of, of rare instructors, for example, access to new lab spaces, uh, cost savings for the institution, opportunities to work in new contexts. Wonderful things come from multi-campus instruction. Uh, courses taught in a multi-campus format fail easily. They are delicate, subtle things. And there's lots of case studies out there to, to really highlight the problems that people have had. Um, so it's, it's one of those wonderful fruits that if you can uh, find it and pick it and then you're in great shape, but it's, it's something that has to be dealt, dealt with very delicately. So one of the, um, yeah, so lacks of, uh, lack of teaching, social cognitive presence affects students' experience dramatically. And, and one of the biggest challenges, they're all challenges, but one of the biggest challenges certainly is teaching. So teaching presence uh, in, in this scenario. Uh, failures in technology, also a huge issue. So uh, maintaining equity and con considering that uh, working with the institution to, to make uh, technology solutions available and, and backups available is essential. And then uh, training and careful planning is required to realize the full benefits of this sort of course. So uh, course preconception through maintenance within a multi-campus context. Uh, it's a little bit more comp complicated, let's say, than approaching a normal course, uh, but you really need to think from the ground up about how you will implement this course successfully within a program and, and within, a, within a university. Uh, context is so important, not just our own, but the com context of, of multiple uh, campuses as well. Equity, not equality must be stressed and ongoing educator self-reflection and adjustments from student feedback is also very, very important so that you can adapt to problems as they occur. So CTLT is, uh, is working to develop more training material on this. Uh, you're welcome to contact them. Uh, you're also welcome to contact uh, me or Casey. My email address is shown down there uh, for access to uh, an asynchronous resource that Casey and I are gradually assembling uh, with a whole bunch of case studies and additional information and tips and recommendations and best practices and challenges and lots more of this stuff uh, uh, on, on the subject of multi-campus instruction. So uh, with, the, with the intention, of course, about building uh, better, better trained teaching capacity at UBC and, and perhaps elsewhere as well. Uh, and, and realizing some of these benefits from, from teaching in a multi-campus format. We have, um, uh, so when we slide, share the slides, we have a number of references as well that, uh, that might interest you. So we have a, a variety of case studies, included, including some of the ones that we talked about uh, during, during this uh, presentation. Uh, we have additional references that discuss um, COI or community of inquiry in more detail. And then we have some references as well that uh, will dig into best practices or, or propose best practices by a variety of authors. 
so that's the presentation. Uh, thanks very much for, for attending and participating. And I think we still have about five minutes left for questions. So by all means, uh, unmute yourself if you have questions or throw your questions in chat and Casey and I will happily answer if, <laughs> if we can. Great, thanks everybody.